Okay. Um, yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, today's session is just going to be um, an introduction to some of the tools that you're going to be using throughout the week. So it's more or less going to be a quick um, theoretical overview um, where we'll look at a couple of use cases where um, some of the tools will be used and um, just have an uh, introduction to the basic data engineering concepts. Okay, so um, I believe I'm sharing my screen. Okay, so yeah. Um, yeah, let's start off with, um, I think everyone can see my screen. Yeah, let's start off with what a data engineer um, is defined and um, what a data engineer does. Um, okay, so the, theoretical definition it's, is that it's a, he, he or she is an IT worker um, whose primary job is to prepare data for any use, right? It might be for the machine learning engineers, for the data scientists, um, for anyone that is actually going to be um, utilizing the data um, at the end of a specific business process. Um, yeah, and so really analyzing that business need and analyzing the use for the data um, much later on is really essential and how you orchestrate the entire pipeline, um, how you get the data and how you actually uh, provide it to the end user is really um, necessary and what a data engineer really looks at, right? Um, yeah, so this is very different to what a data scientist does. Um, what a data, it, it all depends on the company role. Um, sometimes uh, machine learning engineers job description might overlap as a data scientist but they're mostly the big data wranglers or the ones that actually analyze this um, large data sets that are provided by um, specific data engineers. Um, and so a data scientist roles combines um, computer science, statistics, and mathematics, while a data engineer is mostly focused on um, the engineering aspect, um, how um, the algorithms work or how the pipeline is actually laid out, right? Um, yeah, and so what data engineering is, I believe we've covered it already when we've defined what a data engineer is, but a data, data engineering is the practice of um, designing and building systems for collecting, storing, and analyzing data at scale, right? So that's, that's it. It's just the engineering aspect of the data itself. Um, it's a broad field with applications in just about every industry. Um, organizations have the ability to collect massive amounts of data and they need the right people and technology to ensure it. Um, and that's why it is really one of the most um, available and one of the most highly uh, paying jobs out there at the moment, right? Um, so data engineers are um, in big um, fan companies are making more than 400 grand a year, um, which is a lot of money. Uh, so. Yeah, uh, data engineering is really becoming uh, really popular because everything is data driven these days. Um, yeah, so another just theoretical definition to be aware of is the difference between data lake and data warehouse. Um, so a data, so a data lake, it's a massive repository. It might be a structured or unstructured data, um, and the purpose for this data has not been defined. Um, so um, we're going to look at. Um, the differences between what an ELT process and an ETL process is later on. And then you'll really understand what the use of data lake is and um, how we've, how there was this huge shift of, uh, how there was this huge shift from the ETL approach where you'd extract some data, you'd just, you'd do some transformation to just um, take the piece of data you want um, and load it into your database, right? Um, and where was storage becoming so cheap over the past couple of years, um, there was this huge shift where um, everything that is extracted, you extract as much information as you can and um, as, much as, as much information as the law requires. So you extract as much data as you can and you load everything. Right, and um, there are going to be various use cases or various business um, cases that are already defined for a specific set of data, and that also use that specific data. So, 
you would then maybe use um, a data warehouse for that specific specific batch of data um, because you would then probably create uh, more frequently and whatnot. So yeah, these are the differences between a data lake and a data warehouse. Um, in a data warehouse, the purpose of the data has been has been properly defined, where a data lake you're just um, extracting everything. Yeah. So this diagram um, clears what we've just talked about mostly. So in an ETL approach, um, you extract some data, you transform it, and you load it. Right. So when really storage was quite expensive um, previously. So if you're extracting a lot of data, um, loading everything into maybe your database or your data warehouse um, and loading everything and having uh, having track of all of those data was um, really inconvenient, right? So you do some transformation to just keep what you want. And so that was the ETL approach. And in the ELT approach, um, you extract the data and you load that data and you do your transformation later on. And that's when you've used tools like dbt to do the transformation over data that has already been loaded, right? Um, yeah, and there are also other various approaches that actually combine this tool that you can um, you can do an ETLT approach where you're extracting data and that data might, um, even though you want to keep track of maybe everything and you want to use this ELT approach, that data can't directly be loaded into your um, into your data repository, right? Um, and so you then have to do some maybe transformations um, to actually make it in a format that can actually be loaded into your database. And so you can combine this two and depending on your business needs, you be switching between um, these two. So this is one image that I've took from this URL. There, it's, there is a reference at the end, um, which you can take a look at, but this is an example of a data pipeline, right? Um, where it is actually doing an ELT approach where um, it's extracting data, which in this ingestion phase, um, where it might be from maybe an existing database, from an IoT device, from any front-end application. Um, in this week's challenge, um, the uh, you are going to be extracting some data from front-end applications um, when users are actually going to be um, recording that audio, right? Um, and so that audio is then going to be, is actually extracted from user devices, right? Um, and after that extraction, there this extracted data is then loaded. Um, in this example, it can be um, either in your data lake on your, or on your data warehouse, um, and you can have a bit of both at the same time, depending on um, what you're trying to do, but that's just what's happening here. There's this ingestion phase where data is extracted and loaded into some data storage, um, and the data engineering really comes here, right? where where um, in our case we've chosen to implement Kafka right and implement this publish subscribe model so um, you're still going to be handling this ingestion phase where you're actually going to be um, doing the front end as well um, and even maybe some analysis and this is where um, building a a text-to-speech engine would come in, you are not required to do that. That's what we've discussed about early on. But yeah, you'd be required to handle the ingestion part, but using that publish subscribe model, you can really see the flow where data can then be, can then be pushed into Kafka where Kafka will be handling your data. Is that is that a question or? Yes, uh, I want to know what is an I IoT, is it background? Um, okay. Okay, so it's an Internet of Things device. Um, it, it meets Internet of Things where um, various things that you have are connected to the internet. Um, so it might be any, it might also include like sensors um, or anything that can be connected to the internet that is giving out any data. Mm, okay, yeah. So that is what you're going to be handling um, throughout this pro process, right? And so usually what if you are in a, big company, um, you'll definitely be tasked with just doing a single part of this, right? And there might even be an entire team that is 
uh, doing just a single part of this entire diagram because this includes like <clears throat> this includes really large uh, large aspects. Yes, Margaret. Um, did you say Kafka falls under the ingestion part of your drawing? Um, okay, so Kafka is not at this moment um, included here. So there are various parts of Kafka. Um, I believe if when we go on, uh, I think it will be clear. Um, I will go back. I will reference this slide um, because there's we're going to have an overview of Kafka and we'll see how it goes. Um, and let me know if I don't answer it by the end. Um, okay. Um, yeah, so have this diagram, we'll come back to this. Um, yeah, but another core concept to understand is the difference between batch processing and stream processing, right? Um, so batch processing, we're taking information. Um, for example, there is an employee at this case, maybe entering data, right? So there is some information that is then forwarded to this might be any other entity um, and that entity, you might take that data and maybe store it uh, for some time. So um, there are, depend. It, it all depends on your use case. Um, for this case, we're actually going to be uh, using Kafka to handle, um, to har to handle our stream processes. Um, but there are, depend if you're trying to do maybe transformations on your streams, um, you, you would be looking at other tools like Spark um, and so on. So there are many tools that you can use, um, but just having this theoretical overview of batch processing and stream processing. Um, stream data is coming in like continuously, like, like I'm speaking right now and you're actually handling it, right? So, or I'm speaking right now and Meets is, Google Meets is actually um, parsing the data, right? It's handling, it's handling my audio that is converted into a digital format and handling, handling it as a stream of bytes, right? And so that's um, this continuous flow um, is stream processing. Yeah, so tools and data engineering, there are just so many to choose from and so many new tools that are coming out that are solving different problems um, that people actually face, right? Um, yeah, so some of the tools that we're going to use actually to solve are this to create this big data pipeline is Apache Kafka, right? So the the exact definition from the front page of Apache Kafka is Apache Kafka is an open source distributed event streaming platform. Um, yeah, and it's used by thousands of companies. Um, it, it has really high performance and can scale um, so much and it can really handle uh, mission critical applications, right? Um, okay, so how Apache Kafka works is like we've discussed before, it uses this um, publish subscribe model, right? Um, so in this case, the publishers are in Apache Kafka's case are in our code producers and the subscribers are known as consumers, right? Um, and going back to the radio station analogy that, that I used earlier on. Um, <clears throat> so if you have a radio station that um, actually has multiple content, right? So you can imagine this producer one, producer two, producer N, uh, being different topics of uh, content, right? So you can think of this maybe as um, a sports a sports session or a sports broadcast um, over that um, over that radio station. This can be uh, a news broadcast um, over that station, and this might um, yeah, this might just be uh, a podcast or something, right? And so this specific this specific streams are actually being produced, right? So that produces um, some amount of data um, into specific into specific topics or um, into specific places where they're handed, right? Um, and so those, those sessions that are being broadcast by um, the organizers of those events um, are actually producing it, producing those, um, producing those or publishing that content 
to the to that radio station, right? Um, and that radio station has um, specific um, specific conditions, specific terms where it actually handles uh, handles those broadcasts. Um, and so you'll have a high over a really dive a really deep dive in Kafka, but um, over this just general analogy, you can think of this entire cluster as the radio station, which is which is placing um, all of those um, all of those published uh, sessions um, into specific places where users can actually listen on, right? And so um, Margaret can then consume to whichever of those sessions that the that the radio station is hosting. So if you're just thinking of it as maybe a single radio station, this might not make sense, um, and it might not really that might not be the best analogy, but that's the case. So and Margaret can consume, Nathaniel can consume, um, Jose can consume. So anyone can actually consume um, from that specific arrangement that uh, the radio station actually has been published. Right. So we have this publish subscribe model where. Um, there is this data that is being generated and there is this data that is being consumed. Um, and there is this really beautiful um, middleman that is actually handling everything, right? And so that is Apache Kafka. So um, if you're just going back to this question, right? So this Apache Kafka can, can actually fall in all of the parts of uh, this picture, right? Um, so our application can have um, a producer where um, the user is actually producing that audio, right? So there is this, the producer is actually coming from the applications in this case. And so our Kafka cluster would then be somewhere in the middle if we're not, um, would the, the cluster would then be right here. And from that cluster, um, you could have maybe um, a consumer script that then loads it into the data warehouse, right? Um, and so the producers and the consumers can fall um, on different parts of the ingestion and the analysis, but the cluster would then fall in the middle, um, working together with the data warehouse or the data leak. Um, but does, does that answer your question, Margaret? Um, yes, thank you. Yes. I have a question uh, for the distributed systems who have load balancers. I don't see the difference between Kafka and those software that does load balancing. Can you just explain more okay. the difference between them? Okay, so load balancing and what Apache Kafka do are different. Like what a load balancer technically does is, for example, if you have an application that is going to be handling requests, um, it distributes those requests. Um, it distributes those requests up, uh, across maybe um, different microservices or different instructs in um, different architectures, right? Mm -hmm. um, so what Kafka is doing is it is providing this um, it is, yeah, so Apache Kafka can actually be distributed across platforms and you can scale it up on its own where it can be used as a load balancer, right? But it is doing so much more, right? So if you have a Telegram application, um, okay, let's say, um, what well, example can I take? Okay, so we've said that you, you're going to be working on a crypto related project and, um, over the coming week and, um, Let's take that as an example. And uh, that crypto trading bot, um, you're maybe making it for a company and that person actually wants to see notifications on their Telegram, right? Or they want to, they also want to see a notification on a dashboard they want you to build. Um, they also want you to, they also maybe want you to integrate another service, which is the mobile app, right? Um, and so maybe this, a single notification, um, might actually, uh, might actually need to be distributed to uh, even more than those three platforms. Right. Um, and if you have like, 
if you have every component that is really distributed everywhere, you'd have this um, really messy line, which was a single service, a single part of your architecture connecting to another part, one part connecting to another part, right? Maybe this notification is being generated by a single backend, but that single backend is then being connected to three front-end components, right? If you add another backend for another service, then that backend might go on to be connected to that backend itself, but then again to all of this, those three services, right? And when this interaction flow really starts to happen and you have different teams, you need this centralized place which can act, which is still distributed that can really handle um, your interactions. Okay. okay so yeah, there, there, that's the difference. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, and another tool, you've all used uh, Apache Airflow over the previous weeks. Um, so there will not be any need to dive into this, but um, yeah, you can use Airflow to automate lots of maybe repetitive tasks um, on your, either on your data pipeline or um, any pipeline that you actually want or any flow that you actually want to automate, right? Um, so in a simple case that I can think of right now is um, we've talked about the difference between batch processing and stream processing, right? So if you're collecting though, if you were collecting data from users, um, in your case, if you're collecting the audio from the users and um, you're storing it and you actually want to do some transformations or you actually want to check, I think a question, a good question that was raised was um, how do we check the quality of the audio? Um, or whether or not any the person actually recorded that good audio right and so you might have you might check this on the fly and you might actually check each stream um but if that is really not necessary and if that becomes expensive you can do some batch processing right you can store all of those audio files and you could have maybe a single airflow dog that is actually going to be triggered to actually check for right, this inconsistency um and remove maybe unnecessary audio files and then load uh, that audio file into your data storage. Um, and so that is one flow and you can you can definitely find more use cases for Airflow. Um, yeah, and Apache Spark is, um, it's an open source unified analytics engine for uh, large scale data processing. And um, you can think of some of the things that it does just like being NumPy, but at a very larger scale. And, um, yeah, it can it can really handle um, lots of transformations. Um, for example, you might want to do some transformations um, when you load your text corpus from uh, the data warehouse and um, yeah, do some transformations before you actually um, even produce it to Kafka if that's one flow that you decide to choose. Um, yeah. But again, we're going to have a really di deep dive in, in Spark as well. I think this is one tool that you have. Yeah, Spark and Kafka will be um, the two main focuses of this week. Uh, yeah, and these are the couple of the resources that I've used uh, while making this slide. And I can add this to the I can add this to the Google Drive if anyone wants to read some of these interesting articles. But that's 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 pretty much it um that's what's required if you've understood how, how kafka works um how the entire architecture is actually going to work um yeah this week's challenge is going to be a breeze um, okay yeah so is that a question yes Mark. yes um okay I, I, I think I did understood or I misunderstood uh, the Kafka example very well. So basically what I understood with the radio station example is that uh, there will be uh, um, more than one uh, session uh, in, 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 the, in the running time. And there may, may be uh, several consumers that consume every session. So basically uh, based on the consumer uh, consumer uh, request uh, the Kafka will uh, will direct that consumer to that specific session 
So um, in terms of uh, this week challenge, um, can you elaborate more about? Uh, because I I, I read that uh, it's a text to speech, but uh, currently I think it's speech to text. Um. Okay. So I think let me again share my screen and let me go back to that. Uh, so um, regarding on this week's channel, I, I don't want you to actually meet Muhammad. Um, so what do you think from this architecture, right? Like it was, it was good. It was really good, the initial description. And so bringing that to this week's challenge, um, what do you think the producer is going to be? What do you think you're going to be um, publishing? And what do you think you're going to be subscribing? So, uh... Uh, initially, I thought it. Uh, initially, I thought it uh, was from text, not a speech. So, uh, so basically, the producer will be a text. Uh, the producer will be a, a, a speech, and the consumer will be the text. Uh, will prompt uh, our back end or our program or our app to produce a speech. Um, okay, so you're not actually supposed to build any machine learning engine that is actually going to be handling any tra transcribing right um what you're supposed what you're going to be doing is you have a specific text corpus and the user is actually going to be providing the audio for that for that text corpus right yes so there is there is no model that is involved you're not um you're not converting any um you're not convert you're not finding ways to convert any text to the speech you're just um providing a text to some user um it might be any predefined user or a random user um and you're getting speech from that specific user right and so in that case um, now, what do you think um, you're publishing, and what do you think you're subscribing? You're, you're subscribing. To? Uh, so I think that uh, I'm, I'm I'm publishing uh, the text for the end user uh, to give me uh, the speech, and uh, yeah, uh, so uh, I will get ingest that speech to my database. So I would link that text to that specific. Speech. Yes, exactly. Um, yeah, so you've produced that. Um, you've produced that text. If when you've, okay, so yeah, um, like try try and think of like there is there is this flow where um, a single entity, um, the single user that you're talking about, can also be um, both the publisher and the consumer. Right, both the producer and the consumer. So, yeah, just taking that audio, um, yeah, taking that text, showing it to the end user, um, that is one flow of that published subscribe model that Mohammed described, and um, the reverse way can also be another flow. Mm. So, um, the whole the whole flow of uh, this week project will be, uh, I will. Uh, ingest the data uh, from the provided data and present, present that data in the front end uh, web page, uh, prompting uh, the user or the end user uh, to give me a speech uh, or a voice uh, of, uh, for that specific text. So with that, uh, I will manage uh, to link that specific voice with the text. Is it right? yes yeah and yeah um once you get um the specific audio from the user over all over on the front end application um then there are other steps that you will do to maybe yeah load it back into your warehouse so i will be using airflow uh for before when i'm ingesting the data and presenting it then i will use kafka uh to link the text with the voice to do that streaming um yes right? yeah yeah everything is is a stream 
right? Uh, almost, yeah, I think everything can be considered into a stream. Um, yeah, and so it's just this um, continuous flow that is happening between um, your end user and your backend in this case. Yeah, just okay. the flow that you described. Thank you. Thank you. No problem. Um, yeah, so OCS. Yeah. Okay, yes. Uh, I think that I have understood the different tools, but but separately. So I'd like to know how to link them, how to use them to, uh, I think, in the pipeline together, how to link them, practice. Uh, how to link which, which two things? Uh, Airflow, Spark, and, uh, and, uh, and Kafka. Um. Yeah, so we've stated that Kafka is the main actor, right? Um, Kafka is the main actor here, where it's really orchestrating every flow that is happening um, within our application. Um, and uh, yeah, so if you are to maybe draw a diagram, uh, how would you actually, okay, so if we had actually um, used even maybe Google, um, maybe use the Jamboard to actually have any, okay, so whiteboarding, you can start any whiteboard, right? So it's creating the jam. Um, yeah. Okay, so people who have joined are external. Okay, let me show you this. Okay, so um, I think you can join, right? Um, is it on the link or? I think any, everyone can join to this Jamboard, right? Or, yeah. So I believe you can join in. So Sas, I want you to actually join in and um, sketch the initial, like a very rough draft, because this is actually what you have to submit and everyone has to work on together with their group, but an initial phase of um, how you think this, um, this specific architecture has actually worked, right? So you can use. Uh, um, Asaria, could you please um, make the link open to everyone? Um, okay. Thanks. So anyone with the link. Um, yeah, I'm going to make you all the editors. Um, do not mess this up. Really bad. Uh, yeah, so yeah, we'll just like I want you to let's think of this as Kafka. Uh, where's the text? Uh, and where you think, like, um, we have other actual use cases where okay, so we have maybe um, our user application, right. Um, yeah, we have a user application and um, we would then go on to, again, I guess let's use this. Uh, yeah, make, make it make it pretty. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, and we have, uh, let's say our text corpus, right? Our text corpus. Um, we don't even need this. And so where would you think um, Spark, we've cleared up the flow of um, this producer consumer um, flow that's happening, um, but where do you think Spark comes and what flows do you think you can automate at the moment? Uh, 
I think that SPAC will be used for the first will be used to transform the data, to process the data, the test corpus. Okay. Um, so where where is the line? Uh, how do we draw a line? I think that is, so let's just use a marker. So yeah, I'm, I'm using my mouse, so don't judge me. Um, yeah, so there's this text corpus and you see it uh processing uh why can't i edit it okay so okay so processing price okay yeah thank you uh <laughs> so uh you could feel free to move that over there yeah um so processing by spark happens here right so you're doing some processing over on the text corpus and you're producing it into Kafka, right? Okay, yeah, great. So that's one transformation where you've been able to use Spark uh, over on this week's challenge. And what flows do you think you can automate and um, incorporate Airflow into this, right? From this flow of uh, producing text corpus, uh, consuming that text corpus, producing audio, um, consuming that audio file that is generated, um where where do you think airflow can actually come uh so if we have airflow here yeah where where do you think what what do you think you can automate um, inside kafka um inside kafka what do you think you can um use airflow for um i think to orchestrate um, texts coming in and out of Kafka. Yeah, exactly. So um, you'd need this, you'd need to be able to automate um, your text to actually go into Kafka, right? Um, so you could have an automated script, which is um, actually, we could have a continuous script, which is always running, or maybe a backend process, um, or maybe even a function that actually, yeah. So if you have a function that actually just triggers at a certain time, um, that's the use of Airflow, right? So yeah, these are all separate pieces that actually come in together. Um, and yeah, you can also use batch processing if you are going to be processing the audio that is received from your user application. Um, that can also be automated by Airflow. Yes, Margaret. Um, so where exactly does the model fall? You don't have to build a model at this point. Okay? Um, yes, so, yes. I, I know we're not supposed to build, but yeah. just generally speaking, where does it fall? Okay. Yeah, so you have this text-to-speech engine, um, which is converting text into speech, right? Um, and so what where this can fall is your user application is actually collecting more data, a lot of data, right? So if you had a small text corpus to start off with, your model will not be that good, right? Um, so if you have this continuous script um, and you have this continuous flow of audio, that is being loaded into either just Kafka or into your data warehouse, um, you can then just simply even use Airflow to actually automate the training of your model, right? And so if, you've, if you're managing to collect really large amount of audio files um, that can actually improve your model, maybe on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis, or maybe even on a daily basis, um, you can have that automated script by Airflow that is running, uh, which is taking the new data that is being collected um, and actually retraining that model, right? Uh, so that is one like simple use case where you can actually incorporate that ML model uh, and actually have this data engineering pipeline, right? Um, this data pipeline is to get data to a specific business case in in which in our case is uh yeah to just get more data for the machine learning model 
we're going to use. So yeah, this flow allows you to get more data and there are lots of things that you can automate, you can incorporate Airflow in um, and spark it. But I, I hope that that was clear. Yes. Now, I, so, I, I would like to think we'll be running them in Docker. Um, um, okay. Uh, yeah, I think we, we can go back to that. Jose's, um, yeah, Margaret, I'm, I'm not sure if you had another question. Let's clear that up. Um, so it will fall in between um, Airflow and Spark. Um, in this diagram, it does not fall. Like this is your data engineering pipeline. This is your data pipeline. That is, that would have to go into another, that would have to be another design. And that would have to be another system design where it, it actually incorporates it, right? Yeah. So if we just take Airflow, which is doing multiple things, it can, and you have, um, let's add something else here. Uh, what can we add that looks like a data warehouse? Okay. So if this is your, if this is maybe your data warehouse where you're actually, or your data store where you're storing the newly collected audio, right? Um, and just for this case, let's bring the ML model here. And you have this ML model, which is completely separate and has already been trained by maybe someone else. You're not in charge of this. Airflow would take all of this collected data, which has happened um, over on the flow here, right? So it would take all of the data engineering that has happened here and Airflow still being part of this would actually maybe take the data from this, from this data warehouse and use it to train our ML model on a regular basis. Um, makes sense. Thanks. Okay. Um, yes, yes, so sorry. Yes, I, I was asking if we, if we will use, we will, we will run them in Docker. Um, yeah, of course, Docker makes running everything easier, right? Um, it's easier to run Apache Kafka using Docker. Um, it's easier to run Airflow using Docker. Um, there, Spark, there is this PySpark that you're probably going to use if you're going to use Python. Um, so you didn't, you didn't normally, you put, for this case at least, you wouldn't have to use Docker for Spark. Um, but Apache Kafka, um, it's really easier to, to get set up using Docker. But handling Kafka is really a, a difficult and cumbersome process, which is why, um, and even Airflow, you've seen if you want to go to, a, to the advanced configuration and advanced management, and when you really scale up, um, it really becomes a problem. So um, even um, AWS has uh, managed service, service or managed workflows for Apache Airflow, uh, where they actually handle uh, the Airflow orchestration. And so everyone would just be in charge of writing the docs, right? Um, and there is Airflow MSK. Um, MSK manage Kafka service or okay, so MKS no uh, managed Kafka. Oh, I'm, I'm I've chosen Airflow. Okay, AWS managed Kafka service. So yeah, the MSK. Um, yeah, so this is a fully managed service that is um, all managed by AWS, and you'd have access to. Um, specific brokers that actually um, allow you to connect to the Kafka cluster, right? Um, and so there are, these tools are really huge enterprise tools. Um, but if you wanted to go on and actually work over on AWS, or if you're maybe on a small team, or there isn't anyone who actually wants to handle all of this infrastructure, there are just managed services. Um, but knowing how they work underneath is really the core part of, um, a data engineer's work, and that is why you're required to know this. Yeah. I have one last question. Uh, what do you think that we have to do first in this week project? I mean, I think it's follow the follow the weekly challenge and definitely go through the tasks in 
the same order. If you have a clear vision, do your, this is enough. I don't want to see this diagram over on the submission, even though it looks really pretty. I want to see <laughs> everyone's, everyone's concept of their own diagrams, but yeah, really work on this pipeline, really understand those tools and, um, yeah, just having a solid understanding of all those work of, all of those tools and maybe doing small examples and really small projects on it to understand them would be um, the best option to go through in my eyes. Um, yeah, I hope that is clear. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. No problem. Uh, yeah. Margaret. Um, back to the drum board. Um, okay, um, the, isn't the user application supposed to be, um, like the one to, uh, should it not be close to the text corpus such that, um, okay. I don't get the user application part and how it's useful in this. Okay, so how are you getting the audio? Um, how, how, how will you get the audio for the text? Corpus? Um, through a user interface when someone reads the text provided. Exactly. So that's the user interface, the user application. That is the okay. Interface. So the input is audio and the output is supposed to be a text. Um, no, no, no. Um, so what is the user going to be reading out loud, right? They're uh, going to be... mm, go, on. go on. Um, the user is supposed to read from the text, um, given on the user interface. And then yes. the audio uh goes to the model which transforms it to okay through the through the tools uh to orchestrate in and out yeah okay so yeah like Margaret, for, i think like forget the ml model and um like oh, okay sorry i've lowered the hands um yeah yes and um if anyone wants to maybe explain the flu um if it's clear, uh, yeah, I'm denying if it's not a question. Um, I have a question actually. I don't have an explanation. <laughs> okay. Uh, me, I'm sorry. Um, no problem. Uh, okay. Can you go maybe? Okay. Internet. Is that an explanation? For that yeah. Can I try to like, uh, just share my understanding of like from this diagram? Yes. So, uh, uh, the application uh, will be like uh, a display, will have a display on a, a text. So like the user has to, we're, we're trying to collect a big data set to, to train our machine learning model uh, by just collecting the audio uh, format of a given text. So like we, uh, we can do it in a traditional way. Uh, if you were to do it in a traditional way, we might set up a, a single backend and uh, the data stream from uh, the applications will go to that uh, backend and we'll just store it in our data warehouse or do all sorts of like uh, uh, machine learning model training and all that stuff. But it would be very challenging if we're doing it in a very large scale because like uh, traditional uh, backends can concurrently like get a very little amount of data. So Kafka will uh, orchestrate like a very, very large amount of data by just uh, like it has a, a lot of, uh, like, there is a concept called broker. Uh, so like those brokers will take a different stream of data and uh, like uh, and parse it or like push it to different another like output or output of data or like another uh, places. So like it's kind of uh, a way or a, a pipeline that could like handle very large amount of data, stream of data at once without like uh, failing. So that I think that's uh, uh, the way it goes. Like the user gives the audio data 
and it will go through the Kafka and our airflow, I mean, uh, and like we do the processing uh, and do different things like the, to send the, uh, the text data to the application and like Kafka will take care of like uh, getting the stream of data. I think that's what it does. That's my understanding. Yeah, that, that's really, that's really good. Um, yeah, does, does that clear things up? Okay. Um, maybe. Um, like, um, I think the ML model definitely is really complicating things over that is left because you haven't worked on the model to actually um, implement that engine over on the past weeks. Um, but yeah, what, what do you understand now that the user application is doing? Um, I think I understand that the the user application is the front end and then the text corpus is on the back end sides. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. And yeah, um, you need a way to get that text corpus uh, onto your user application so that you get that audio from the user and you get that audio back into the back end. Okay, uh, I think it makes sense now. Thanks. Um, yes, and Tanan. Uh, uh, yes, uh, so my question is uh, about what Kafka does, really. Um, yeah, maybe I missed something. I I didn't understand. So we have two streams of data. So we have the text coming from one side and the audio coming from the other side. And uh, but these data are, or uh, I mean, the text is already stored somewhere and uh, the audio we are going to store in a in a data warehouse, right? So, yes. so what does why why do we need Kafka in the middle? Can't uh, the data come directly from maybe the user application directly to the data warehouse? I I, I don't get. Yeah, yeah, you can you can definitely do that, and on a small scale, it really does not make sense. Like Andina described the exact approach where you can actually take out Kafka, and you'd have your user application directly connected to your backend. Um, and, and handling all of those processing, right? Uh, but keeping yeah. even this weekly challenge um, at hand, um, let's say you actually want to, you actually maybe want to connect, uh, you actually want to collect data for lots of languages, right? Um, so there are even countries which have many languages, right? Um, not even just a single one. Um, and so, if you had those, if you had um, those like really different text corpuses and um, you had different applications that were actually collecting the data, it would almost be as if like, um, for example, for the 50 something countries that are um, in Africa, um, you'd then have to be maintaining sort of like those 50 something different systems, right? And so Kafka will, when, when you're doing it on a small scale and, and, and at an initial scale, it might not really make sense, right? So you might just have a single topic for the audio, um, which is hand, which is, um, yeah, I did not want to get into this uh, topic configuration, but for example, like topic is just uh, how you handle a data stream that is uh, being handled, right? So you can have a text topic, right? So you have these two topics and this is just a single system uh, for like a single application, right? And so when once you start scaling all of this up, um, it will really be like, it will really be a savior. Like having all of those connections, having all of those different user endpoints, um, having all of those um, streams of data happening um, you will need a centralized place to actually collect everything. It's it's sort of like um, you can do everything. Um, Git is a distributed version control system, right? Um, so we, everything is distributed, but we need GitHub in the middle at the end to sort of orchestrate everything, either GitHub or any um, any centralized. We choose a centralized Git repository, even though Git is distributed. And so even if you do, if having this centralized piece that can actually scale, it becomes really relevant once you start scaling your application. Uh, okay, I think I get it now. It's, um, 
um yeah so uh, but i have another question if it's okay i think yeah yeah no yeah so you said uh, the part on the user application you said that we have we can have different user applications aren't we going to design this user application or this part to have like are we going to or how are we can't we control what we are what kind of audio type or what, whatever data from that side is 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 going to be if we're going to design that part yeah, i don't know if my questions make sense uh the part of the user application are we going to design this uh where the data is coming from from the from the user side um yeah so like you're you're going to be designing yeah the entire user application and you're you're going to be handling um how you collect that audio right um okay okay so and like what type of design did you have in mind like no, I'm just saying like we are going to have a unified, uh, like we can have a unified way of getting this of this data. It's not going to, we're not expecting it to come from different sources, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For this case, yeah. But if this is scaled, yeah, that's why Kafka is here. And um, Kafka really allows you to also specify, um, there are lots of things that you can actually do. Um, there are sp specific connectors that allow you to, get data that is actually stored in Kafka. If you are maybe um, not even doing any transformations, the the aspects that we've talked about, if you take the ELT approach and you want to load everything, um, there are specific source connectors where um, the data is then automatically connect, uh, loaded into um, maybe your data lake or any data storage. Um, and it allows maybe even to specify um, a specific schema into this unified uh, data structure that you're talking about. And you can even specify that on Kafka so that there is this consistency that is kept. Um, and so all of those things that you'd have to manually think about, manually enforce, you can uh, simply add in specific configurations that Kafka already has built in. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so I, I hope everything is clear. Um, yeah, and okay, okay, can it if does okay. that <clears throat> the, the user interface part? So, I thank you so much for the answer, which I already get the overflow of the crowd, the whole project in the user interface part. Uh, um, which tools we are going to use for user interface development. Mm -hmm. I think that Kafka and Airflow are all are working at the back. So if, mm -hmm. we, if yeah. I understood. Um, I don't <laughs> think there is any, there is any specific specification over on the challenge document. If anyone has read it uh, completely and there's any specification, uh, you can tell that, but um okay so yeah i like uh is there any specific framework that you have to use you don't have to so i think you can you can use react if you want to okay. um you can have a simple flask backend and just use jquery to get the audio yeah it, okay. it depends on you or what you use yeah. okay okay thank you so much no, no problem yeah Okay, so if that's it, or we can end the call here. Um, um, maybe I don't know, if we can just, if you guys have more questions, yeah, everyone is joining the call, so a few minutes. Can we wait a few minutes, Azari? No, oh, okay. Um, yeah, I, I don't think I have anything to talk about, but... Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So do you guys have any question? Yeah, okay. So if that's a well, question, then hold that thought because um, you guys can <laughs> maybe ask uh, more when you have to joins. Yeah. But if it's yeah. Yeah, still you can still ask though. Sorry. Oh no no no. I think we can we can wait. Uh, um am I supposed um, to ask now? Sure, go ahead. As I don't see. Okay, so we we'll, we will be using AWS uh for uh the development of this week, the whole development. 
Yes. Or yeah, Naruto says. Okay, so what do you mean by development? So, um, you have access. Yeah, you do have access to the AWS, but uh, you don't have to. We don't have models to train here, so you may not need. You may not need it as much. But you can use it, use it to develop anything. By the sure what you mean. Yeah. By development, I mean. Um, uh, initializing airflow and uh, set up in Kafka and so on to do this project to do this, this week project uh, in AWS. Okay, um, maybe yeah, but what would you like to answer that? The question is, um, I, I, I didn't get the question, so what is the question? Sorry. Uh, are we supposed to to do uh, this week project, uh, the whole week project on AWS? So we'll, we'll be initializing, uh, installing uh, and implementing Airflow, Kafka, and Spark uh, on the AWS, not in our yes. devices. Yeah, I mean, it, it's easier uh, if you do that. Yes, because so, because my device will not handle that much yes. of Docker. Yes, and even now, so uh, I think just for Kafka, we will. We, you try it now, but I think hopefully, uh, if it's not already even set up, like uh, um, maybe Azaria and Didia, you may they may comment on it. But we are planning to give you actually also Kafka installed in another place. So we just give you. Um, the link, basically how to access Kafka, and also um, a database as well, just uh, RDS, in such a way that you'll be able to, because the machine we gave you, at least for now, I realized it was not strong enough. It was still only just eight. I think, uh, let me just check while I'm here. It's C7G to X large, so. So that is and da 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 so C seven. Seven gigabytes large. It has a sixty gigabyte memory, and then eight CPU. Okay, so it's still not not that sufficient. Probably, I mean, it, it will work for definitely for Kafka. It's more than enough uh, for Kafka and working with. But uh, no, for sorry for Airflow. But we might also just install for everyone uh, and and then you can work you can just basically access that because the whole point of this week is actually to use instead of installing too much because you have used already you have installed uh, airflow before hopefully you have already installed uh, uh, you have had databases installed so you know you have a certain experience but much more to use it to be able to use them to access them to work with them is the key idea so yes work on the cloud as much as you can and if needs be we will upgrade the machine to be more sufficient but you will work we expect that you use extensively the cloud instead of your 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 machine uh, if your machine is strong of course feel free but it's better to use the cloud okay thank you Are we done with the? Questions? No, I think um, we were still answering some questions. Um, yeah, uh, there are hands that have been raised already. So Margaret, I'm sorry. I I think that was a mistake. Okay. Um, Lucas. 
Yes, uh, I've understood that we work in a AWS, but uh, I don't have any experience with it, so I don't know if we cut the tutorial on it or if we provide the material as a guide in order to learn how to work in AWS. Uh, I don't know if you heard me. Um, I, I, I did not get that. Uh, maybe you can repeat uh, right. Maybe if you have a Yeah, I, I said that uh, I don't have any experience with AWS, but this week we work with that. So I don't know if we have a tutorial or if you can provide uh, material that will help me to know, to learn how I can use it. Yeah. Um, Basically. Yeah, so the basically the EC2 instance that is being provided, it is exactly the same as just working on your machine, right? Um, so as long as you have that SSH connection where you're connected to that instance, it's just as if you were working locally. So all you need is um, the shell scripting knowledge, right? Um, to create all of those things, but specific, um, specific things that you might use um we've talked about the managed uh the managed kafka service which we will be setting up so um you won't need to worry about that um i guess so um yeah there, there isn't really much resources but we'll try to share um some basic resources that you might need to know um about aws that would be helpful like um the vpc um, different subnets, um, different IP configurations that um, are going to be read of it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, just to complement, in this particular case, you really don't need any AWS knowledge. Uh, you would even, if I set it up in my own machine here in my office, it's going to be still identical from your perspective. But it is a very good question that it's important to use this opportunity to learn a little bit of it. You know, what, how do, like, if you were on our side setting up this thing, then you would you would need a AWS knowledge. But in in the user's case, it's basically, as Azari as said, no need to know for now. But it, that doesn't mean it is important. It's, it will be nice, yeah, it's kind of some, discussion around AWS, what is VPC, you know, what are the key elements of, you know, maybe ask it in Slack, but as on the side, it's even if it's not relevant for it, but it's very good discussion because people, and then maybe, you know, uh, whoever has time can give a mini tutorial about that as one of the tutors, just on AWS going through what AWS looks like, you know, what do you need to do that? Um, as, as I said, what is VPC? What is I don't know, how our permissions and roles uh, are set, um, and what services do you have in AWS? You know what what is EC2, what is S3, kind of more. But you unfortunately you will not have access at the moment. You only have access to the machine, which is basically just uh, using SSH only. Okay, but uh, I think that I don't even know how to access the machine. The SSH, you mean to do SSH? Yes, I know. I I I have the SSH key, but I don't know. Yeah, how but like to... to be able to SSH. So so using now your SSH key, you have to. So we will just get to that now. Actually, maybe we can use you as. So do you have Ubuntu or what? What kind of system do you have? I have I have Ubuntu. Okay, so. Yeah, we will we'll get to that. So maybe other questions and then just because we want everyone to, to be able to log in uh, SSH today. So we would um, we'll get back after the QA session. Okay. 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 Azaria, to you. I'm, I'm just interfering. Yeah, um, yeah, Nathaniel, go on. How are we going to access the 
Apache uh, Airflow dashboard. After we somehow install and set up on the AWS module, how are we going to access that, the dashboard? Um, yeah, so what you're going to be doing is setting up uh, port forwarding. Um, if you're going to have to add um, specific configuration for the specific port that Airflow is going to be run on, and you want to map a port on your local device, which is going to be um, showing that um, showing that Airflow interface, right? Um, and you just have to modify that SSH configuration that you specified. But if you're also using um, Visual Studio Code, um, it handles all of the port forwarding itself. If the SSH connection that you're doing is um, you're using VS Code, it's just a click of a button. So um, does anyone else have any questions? Um, yeah, so if that's, okay, yeah, yes, Sintana. Yeah, uh, yes, so I just to, to summarize my understanding, just to see if I understood correctly what you said. So we need to have uh, Airflow and a database installed our, in our own computers, and then we will use the cloud uh, with its Kafka installed to to do like they is they, it's going to be working as if it's just one machine right um no so like doing that you're actually decoupling your system and um you're having some components over or on your local machine and you're having other components on the cloud so if you what's it, what's been advised is to use to actually run everything on the ec2 instance right or so over on the machine that is um, on AWS. So Airflow um, should be running on the EC2 instance and you should expose a port to actually access it um, on your local machine. So all Airflow, um, Kafka, and everything that you'll be doing, any transformation, any um, Jupyter notebook, any data exploration, and everything. Um, if we uh, go back to our diagram and uh, yeah, so everything that, that has been specified here um is going to be over on uh the ec2 instance right nothing nothing is happening um over on your local machine um what's happening is just you get uh you're previewing that instance from your machine so every okay. component here is over on the ec2 yeah okay okay thank you no mm. yeah so if, if everything is clear i think we can go to or underneath the EC2 instance. We 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 we're given. Does it has uh, enough resources to handle all of that? In principle, um, yeah, principle it does. It it will. So currently, it has sixteen gigabyte RAM and eight CPUs. It's and but we are we will be able to scale that up if you need if, depending on use case so but it's it's sufficient for all practical purposes it's sufficient and just put if you have more data gigabytes of bytes of whatever data let's know so that we we give you like if you put it in your notebook folder it's okay it will never be full because that your notebook folder the one that's basically you are using for uh, you to, to write to work with Jupyter Notebook, then that one is already in S3, so that means the, it's unlimited number. I mean, of uh, storage. Of course, just use it uh, on the need basis. But almost, I think you would not. Yeah, you would have enough capacity. Yeah, okay. So, um, anyone else? Um, any questions? Okay, Brian. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, can we create a different repo for a group or we work on one repo?
Uh, okay. So Azaria, do you want to answer that or? Um, no, you, you can answer that. Okay. So definitely, yeah, use organization. So you used it before. It's very similar. If you can create a re, uh, organization uh, repo, so that means create for your group and organ like one repo uh, under some uh, organization name, and then that's it. If you all work on it, um, contribute. That's great. If not, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. If not, I mean, I think that's the most recommended. But if for some reason you are unable to set up whatever, then you know, ultimately work on one person's repo, create one repo, work on that person's repo, and then ultimately fork that one and submit. But I would say, if you could create an organization, that's better. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so anyone else? Any other questions? Um, yeah, I, I think if that's if there are no more questions, we can move on to um, SSH resources. Yes. Um, Jose, you want to share your screen um, so that we can go over uh, the connection process? Okay. Uh, I don't know if you can see my screen. It, it's black at the moment. Yeah. Sharing full screen in Ubuntu doesn't give uh, that uh, full screen. So you might share your tab or a window. My tab, okay. Uh, Okay. okay. Now, uh, let me look. Mm, yeah, we can see only your Chrome tab as well, even at the moment. So, can you um, share your internet? Yes, I'm looking for how I can share my entire screen. I did that, but it did not work. Ah. Uh, I can tell. Okay, so uh, when you are sharing, choose sharing a window and then share your tab. Uh, I, okay, do you have a terminal opened? Yes, I have a terminal opened. Okay, then when you share, share a window, and then choose the terminal. The, the, the point is that let me open the office and I will try the terminal. Okay. I can share. So maybe someone else, maybe someone else was unable to connect. Can uh, if just yes, cannot. Okay, that's good. Now you, you are able to connect. 
So we are able to see your. I have opened a VS code, a VS code terminal. I am no. not able to share my. Uh, I'm not able to share the. Sure. So, uh, it, it is okay. So now, are you able? Um, un unfortunately, so can you go and copy? So, if you, I share the link now on the site that you can just go and all you need is to open. So, what editor do you use? in terminal do you know any terminal editor like uh, nano yes okay I'm so using, then i use it open it open open okay open the pass which is in your home directory dot ssh config so basically open by whatever editor you want you can Um, home directory tilde yeah but add tilde maybe in the front yeah slash dot ssh dot config no no not not dot i mean config just without without dot okay and that basically will open outside the view that we have but it's okay as long yes, as but it, it's empty of course yeah now uh which group so i am also so i'm also uh, so if you open also the notion guide that is there i mean unfortunately it, it would be nice for everyone to see if you open something so can you copy okay. can you add can you copy the from the notion just copy everything and then open uh in your uh, vs code a file and paste it there okay so just in your paste code just open some temporary uh, file no no, no. Uh, I have to copy this. So yeah, like so, copy yeah, like, the copy the yeah, just one of them. Like yeah. Now, uh, okay. Uh, not there. Uh, okay. So, and then change change their your name to a user just change to your user like remove everything that's called change and in the thing and then add your username as was specified in the challenge document remove that one the entire thing just change whatever thing let me check yes, my username it, your username Someone also copied for you the your username just uh, on the window so you can copy it from there. I'm looking for my username. It is it's now someone copied it for you from the Google. Okay, Google. okay. Just so you can copy okay. that. Okay. And then which group are you? Group. Uh, I'm group four. Group so four. just change change G3 in, 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 in two places to four, G4. And also maybe just 
for convenience, also host in the beginning the name, the alias, instead of G3, G4. On the beginning. Yeah. No, 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 not that one, not that one. Nah, no, like G, host G3, right? Just the name on top, the first line. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. E4. Okay. Now, now your where is your your SSH key located? Uh, let me look for it. So it usually must be inside the dot SSH. Inside the dot SSH. Yeah, I mean, uh, you may have created it outside, but you must bring it inside. So. Now, where where did you copy your public key? From where did you copy the public key? Uh, it's usually together with the, where the public key is. So when you generate your, your public your keys, it was located yes. somewhere. Right? Yes. Yes. So I have found it. it. Let me, huh? let me show it. I found it. I will show it now. Uh, I think it's here. But we are not seeing your window. So, I mean, if you have a terminal, every all of this would be easier. It's here. Dot SSA. Okay, so just copy the, the first one home, JD, whatever, ID, RSA. Not the public key, but the, the first one, the, the private key. Not that one, the very first, the location, the pass. The first okay, line. Okay, okay. On the first okay, line, okay. there is a pass. Just copy yes, the pass. Yeah. 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 Okay, and then go to the config and replace that change thing again, just from change. Okay. Okay, now you are ready, save this. Okay, and now go to the terminal. Now we need to see your terminal. Your terminal can be from the, I don't know, from the escort, it doesn't matter. Okay. Yeah. Okay. SSH G4. Okay. Um, permission denied. So what you do is no, no, not pseudo, not pseudo, not pseudo, please. Just now change permission. So you basically CH mode. Six zero zero. Uh, then the paste what you had, like the private, the pass to the private key. Okay, yeah, that one, enter. And then now uh, go back to it. No, no, go back to it. Just it's okay. Try it if you want. And try try this. Is just, okay, it might not still work. Permission denied. So now uh, change also dot, the dot SSH folder. So now search mode six, uh, 700, 700, 700. Okay. And then uh, the uh, dot SSH folder. So basically it's tilde dot SSH, tilde. I mean, uh, still like home directory slash dot SSH. Yeah. Dot SSH. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so try it again. Okay, so now uh, ls dot ssh uh, dot slash dot you know by, by is basically when I say dot ssh just tilde dot ssh. Yeah. yeah. No. Yeah. Ssh. Okay. 
so IDRSA, you know, config is, okay, so IDRSA, so is that the IDRSA pub, is that the one you gave, you gave us? Yeah. Great, great. Let me, let me check. SSH. Uh, uh, um. So, Joseph, uh, did you create it, uh, your uh, public key when you were in Windows? No, no, I was not using Windows. So, for some reason, it is not there. Um, so, let me add your... Okay, try it now. Yeah, you're now logged in. Okay. Okay. So, so if I understand, each time if I want to use it, I have to execute SSH. No, now, just exactly. Now you can exit EXIT. Just and then next time you want to do something, now just log in uh, SSH G4. Now it will you log in. Now to go to access Jupyter Notebook, you go to now. Um, let me just check if there is. Uh, Okay, so there is some reason that uh, 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 I thought we will be interacting with the uh, user interface, but uh, it seems that like we will interact with the cloud with a code. No, so it's so you will you can access. So I'm just uh, unfortunately for some reason I didn't install Jupyter Hub. Jupyter Hub. Um, 
So, can you in the meantime, while you are there, can you go to a view, uh, what is called your your Chrome or something, just a, a web browser? Okay. So you can access, of course, both from terminal, you can work from terminal, but the other way is... Uh, So why? So what should I do? Um, just give me a minute. I'm just checking. So in principle, by now, I think um, it's the my, the issue. Just I will fix uh, very soon. Is that if you in the terminal, you can go localhost. Okay. No, uh, not in the terminal. Sorry, it's my mistake. It's in the browser. Okay. localhost uh, 8007 that's that 8007 is the one that you are last so 8007 yeah so in principle this one would give you now i mean now it's not working it's just jupiter hub but this one would give you now a jupiter hub that you can log in that you can use jupiter lab and that the you the password is your username as well as your username is your username so it's both are identical so that would complete, yeah. that means you'll be able to, to work. So under it. So, so can we uh, call Jupiter also in the state? I mean, do we have uh, alter, alter, alter access to like initial stuff, that machine, I mean, on our instance? Sorry, to install? Install Jupiter or other library. Also, Jupiter, you don't need to do anything on Jupiter. Like it's gonna be default installed, and if you install yours, it will just basically break it. Not, but anything else, it's like the Conda environment is there. So that means the basic Conda environment is there. Now, if you want to do anything, you can create an uh, environment. But Jupiter Lab, Jupiter Hub, whatever is just not environment dependent. So you don't need to install them. But if you want to install any other package, whatever, you can install. The, the group two leads basically have root access. Everyone else, basically, just so that we, you know, there will not be a mess, the two leaders would be like, whatever needed, they, they are able to install using sudo. Okay, uh, so like our instance already, Honda, right? Yes. I mean, Python environment has been already up on that. Yeah, the Conda environment is there. The Conda is there. So if you want to create a new a new environment, anyone can create 
Honda environment. Okay, clear. Thank you. So, okay. So now I know some of you might 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 have some uh, still permission denied. I think it seems to me that there was uh, from old time. It didn't copy from the new uh, whatever I updated. Um, so, like I, some of you have changed SSH key, and for some reason it didn't update that. So that's slightly the problem. But I will fix and connect. But is the process clear? That's exactly what you do. So there are basically you, in your home directory, if you are a Windows user, follow as well, just on the notion, but you know, ask, I, I think uh, other people who have used Windows, they may help you. Um, but if you are Linux, basically, or Mac, it's the same. You're just basically gonna add in the config, um, you know, the, the copy from just the notion thing that, 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 that shows a little bit of the guideline. And then you change according to your username, the location to your private key, and your, the location to your private key must be, should be uh, in the .ssh, uh, in the home directory .ssh folder. And then then after that, if, you, if there is, if needs to be, you change permission of your .ssh folder to 700. And I will also add that in the guideline, in the notion guideline. And then um, your private key will be 600. And then just once you do that, it's just SSH to that. And once SSH successful to access Jupyter, you go to your browser and we say localhost 8007. As, so if anything is not clear in that area, ask even in the Notion. I think there might be a possibility maybe if you can ask a Notion or ask in the uh, um, Slack. So under net. Do you have a question on the net? If not, Nathanael uh, Malasa? I've managed to have access to the terminal, but I don't think Conda, it's not installed. Uh, yeah, I but, uh, Conda, but come on, not found. Yeah, I think it's it's got to do with some setup, but I will fix that one. So in principle, I might um, I might remove all the instances and recreate them again, but nothing will change. So still everything that you set up will work. So just, but I, I will update on that. Okay, so I was thinking creating environment using the Python one. Can we do that or should we, should we wait? Yeah, I mean, you can, I mean, I, I think, you know, I just, you can, but in the meantime, I, I might just announce that I'm deleting all of the instances and creating again, or I might not. So just either it will be fixed, but you can still play with that, whatever you like. Okay, just yes. Yes. What if we would like to use VS Code or it? Yeah. So you, if you want to use VS Code, if you have already, I think maybe Azaria can lead you, but you are able. You can able to SSH just exactly now. If you can. Uh, present your base code, you can just follow from that. It's just simple from that as well. Okay, so should I share my screen? You can, yeah. Azaria, maybe you can take the lead. Okay, so I think Azaria has left. Uh, do we have any more questions? No, no, but if not, if not, just okay, let's just go for like go to your connect, like the window, like in the on the left side, there is this the computer icon just down. No, 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 not there. The computer icon, the computer down, down, okay, like on the left, on the left, the computer icon, yeah, no, no, like so. There is like one, two, three, four, five, six, the six icon on the left one. side. Three, four, five, six. This one. Yeah. Above yeah. the extension X. Okay. So now that's container. Okay. That is not that's is that not remote explorer. Okay. Not containers. Go to uh, click the containers. Uh, I think there should be not containers, but SSH. Uh, uh, you're right. It's in the I think on the upper side there is a. Uh, 
an option to change to SSH target. Where is it? A remote explorer. Then containers of uh, expand the containers one. Yeah, expand the containers exactly. Yeah. Expand the containers icon, please. So yes, just a container. Like now you see two things, right? Yeah. No. Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, they, they're supposed to be in my inside. There is a container. Yeah. And this so is maybe, a maybe, maybe can you just share like your screen? Uh, because in principle, okay. that should be just installing maybe a package. So, uh, yeah, uh, should I share so, mine? Yeah, share your screen. Uh, just yes, can you unshare? Yeah. Yeah, I think we can see, like, uh, maybe just if we can increase the font a little slightly. Yeah, exactly. So, as you could see, like, on that icon, you should be able to see you can change either SSH or container or whatever. So, you, you change to SSH targets, and then, yeah, and then you just click that one. G2 and that would connect you. So if you click that, right, like if you are able to connect to host in current window, then that will allow you to connect basically to the root directory of the path. That's as simple as that. Okay. So if you have, if you have questions, just yes, you can connect also um, to those who manage to do that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very Great. much. Okay. Hopefully it's it's all clear, if not clear, but don't don't at all pass tomorrow without connecting. You know, so don't sleep tomorrow night if you are not able to work and connect um between the machines. Just don't allow yourself to do that. Just have that mindset. You will not sleep, like you will leave no stone, nothing unturned. Um before being able to connect and stuff, okay? So just don't don't drift. Um, it shouldn't be Wednesday where you're still unable to connect. It, should, it can't be that. Okay, with that, I think I will hand over that to... Is there anything, uh, Nardos, we have to do or we can finish here? Yeah, I think that's it. I'll yeah, stop. Great. Okay. Great, thanks guys. Cheers.